mean, <laughs> absolutely. What's up, everybody? Welcome to This is MLS. I'm Jillian Sackovitz hanging out in studio alongside my man, Kaylin Carr, Sasha Kleshton, and Taylor Twelman joining us as well. These guys were everywhere this week. Kaylin Carr in D.C., Sasha Kleshton in the studio on 360, on Countdown, on Wrap Up, and Taylor Twelman. Three games, five days, two coasts, and yet you look fresh as a daisy. What's your secret, my friend? Uh, drugs. Wait, wait, did I say that out loud? Is no. it, are we taping this? Sure. Just we kidding, sure just kidding. Jill, Lots got, of sleep and a lot of coffee. I've got a bone to pick with you guys, by what? the way. I mean, I, I, I love DC, love working with you in the studio. Taylor, you were on the Miami game. Sasha, I saw you in the crowd enjoying it. Nobody could leave me a ticket. I mean, what's up? <laughs> that ticket was very hard to come by, Kaylin. I'm just going to say it. All right, we got, these, like we got these guys <laughs> and some other special guests to get you all set for match day three. Taylor, which matchup are you most excited for? Orlando City versus Miami. Not because I'm doing the game, but more so because Orlando City last year showed a little bit of a blueprint on how to get under the skin of Lionel Messi. It was the League's Cup game where Miami would end up winning the game on a soft penalty on Joseph Martinez going down. I just think Oscar Pereira and that, I would say, identity of the locker really believe that they can make Inter Miami in their life very difficult. They can make it a struggle. I think the game against the Galaxy this past weekend has given hope to everyone in MLS to say, wait a minute, if you play with a high tempo, you get under their skin, you defend. I'm very interested to see how Orlando City travels to Fort Lauderdale, Florida, because honestly, Sasha, when you look at Orlando City, you and I are very high on them, but I also think there's a chip on their shoulder. The South American culture in Orlando versus the South American culture in Miami, they both kind of hate each other naturally, and I find it just to be a little, uh, a little interesting to see how this one plays out. I'm really looking forward to that one, Taylor, but for me, it's Minnesota against Columbus. Minnesota, the only team in MLS to win on the road in week one. Yes, it was against Austin FC, but now they come home to play against the champs, Columbus Crew. And I think back to last season, Minnesota won their first three games on the road, didn't win a home game until May. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we're going to see the more of the same this season. We've got the youngest coach in Major League Soccer history taking over for Minnesota United. I want to see what they can do against the champs, against a real tough test early in the season. All right, Sasha, I like that. I'm going to keep my mind still stuck in California, <laughs> not getting the tickets from you guys, but i am got my eye on the Cali Classico. I, I'm old enough to remember growing up in the Bay, watching San Jose going against the Galaxy. Now, granted, Landon was actually on San Jose at the time, so always crazy mayhem at the end of the match, and the Galaxy impressed me in match day one, so I'm eager to see if they can keep that momentum going. The LA Galaxy were just mere seconds from getting a win over Lionel Messi and Inter Miami, Kalen. So it begs the question, are the LA Galaxy back? Well, I, I got too much respect for the Galaxy having, you know, a history, losing to a couple finals to Landon, Beckham, and, and Keane to say they're back. But I would say... I was really impressed by this team, the way they were compact, the way they were able to get out. And this guy right here, Pencil, made a huge impact instantly coming in. The combination play, it was easy to go against the Galaxy last year. Teams condensed the midfield, surrounded and swarmed Ricky Pouge. They got out on the break. Now they have the weapons with Pencil and Peck who came in late. Both look dynamic on the wings in transition. I understand they didn't get the result in the end, but I thought it was a big step forward. You could see the signings made sense from Will Coons, and Greg Vanny's going to be able to build on that. Are the Galaxy back? Is this the question we're really asking after one game where they <laughs> tie Are they coming back home? <laughs> Are they? Okay. This tells me a couple of things that we're asking this question off the top of the show. One, Galaxy is still the super club in Major League Soccer, the most worldwide known team in MLS, mm -hmm. so we are going to talk about them, and they are a big deal, and the league is better when Galaxy are competing for championships, but it also tells me about the expectations we have for this club. They drew at home, and we're asking, are they back? Okay, having said all that, I am optimistic, and I am excited for this team. Joseph Pansil, 
was very good, was very dangerous. Peck looked good coming in on the wing. These are two players that Greg Vanny has been searching for. It's the 4-3-3 he wants to play, and he can finally play the way he wants to play. The whole game is predicated on moving the ball from one side to the other and getting wingers that will run in behind. He tried it with Granzier. It didn't work. Kevin Cabral, no final product. Douglas Costa would not do what Greg Vanny wanted him to do. He finally has a couple wingers. So, yes, I am excited for this team. Are they back? No. Sasha, the reason say, why we're asking the question is, hold on though, Caitlin. The reason why we're asking the question is they've missed the playoffs five of the last seven years. Thank you. Right? And so, Thank you. It, so your expectations are, are different now, right? So now all of a sudden, this is the team I lost two MLS Cups to. Caitlin Carr lost two MLS Cups. This is the winningest franchise in MLS history. This is the brand that everyone still knows. This is the original Galacticos. You can go through all of it. But we're asking, are we back in LA? because they've missed the playoffs five of the last seven years and sasha you said something that everyone has to remember they've always spent money but this time it feels like they spent money the right way the right way because paint seal looks like he's a natural compliment to ricky pooch gabriel peck looks like now granted he's been here 38 hours so we don't know his <laughs> fitness or whatever but he looks tricky diego from is still only 29 he's got something but I'm going to tell you right now, you guys are going to ask this question in about six, eight, nine weeks, and we're going to be asking the same question. Can the LA Galaxy defend? We are talking about a Galaxy team that went up against the oldest team in MLS, the team that has no verticality, the team has no pace, the team that plays at a such a slow tempo, and they get a, I would say, a bogus red card, second yellow, sure, absolutely, but they couldn't see the game out. The fact that they couldn't see that game out still leaves, leaves me this little bit of saying we may be too premature, Kalen, to say are the Galaxy back just because they spent $17 million plus on two wingers that looked apart when their back line, the two center backs are combined 72 years old. I agree, Taylor. And the one thing I would say is the Galaxy have always been the team that's gone around and drawn the crowds. And this was kind of the opposite. And Sash, we've talked before, and I told you, the further away you are from the Galaxy, the bigger the club looks, but the closer you get, I'm not quite so sure anymore. That, that's been some distance in time, I think maybe a little bit up the road that looks bigger now. So I think this was a big uh, atmosphere for me, as you guys both know. Uh, but I would say just in general, the Galaxy are in the same position as every other MLS team. They needed to use this match against Lionel Messi one, to prove to their fans, but also to prove to the sort of broader Los Angeles that this is a team showing worth showing up for and can compete in MLS. Taylor, you mentioned the pace. So will San Jose challenge the Galaxy differently? Yeah, I think so. I think it's just going to be a little bit more of a dynamic team. I mean, Christian Espinosa by himself alone can give you some pace. But there's a dynamism to San Jose. Listen, it, it's so odd to say there's a dynamism to San Jose that a Messi, Suarez, Alba, Busquets didn't have because Alba caused some problems in the second half. But I think San Jose is going to give them a little bit different uh, headache than Inter-Miami did because they can play a little bit more vertical. We're going to get into Miami here in a second, and we have to because with it, what Luis Suarez showed up with San Jose has more mobility up front. They have more dynamism. They'll pose a little bit more of an issue for the center backs from the LA Galaxy. Let's dive more into Miami, Taylor. You've called two Inter-Miami games. You're on another one this weekend. They got a possible four points of six, but yet people still were disappointed. And you mentioned, you know, certain guys not showing up, not perhaps playing to their expectations. Should Miami be disappointed that it wasn't six points this week? because they're playing with a guy that can barely move up front. I, I think if you ask Miami right now, are they lucky to have four points? Tata Martino would tell you right now, absolutely we're lucky. Drake Calendar had to stand on his head, save a penalty, make an unbelievable save against Ricky Pooch to save it. They, they're they going to feel lucky, Jillian, that they got four points. The, the question is, should they be concerned? That's the question. And the answer is unequivocally yes. And I get Redondo's going to come in. But Redondo may have his father's elegance and the bite of a younger Sergio Busquets, but does he have the legs and the dynamism to control the midfield, to run? Sasha, you watched the same game I watched. You watched Wednesday night against Real Salt Lake. This is a team that is very methodical. And the issue is they are getting nothing 
from Suarez. That's not a hot take. Luis Suarez is barely running on two legs. He's barely getting that knee uh, ready to play every single game. And you can see it. Campana comes on and a light switch comes off. Now, all of a sudden, you've got Alba further advanced. They've got more ability through the middle. It's just natural. Gressel has a pep in his It's just natural. They're too slow for me, Sash. I think there's a concern. And I think if you've got a little true serum in Tato Martino, David Beckham, Chris Henderson, and everyone watching that, they'd be like, oh, boy, this is going to be a long slog this year. Yeah, there's big concern there for Luis Suarez when you watch him play. And you just watch the way Inter-Miami plays. There is nobody in the box. Messi dropped deep. Suarez drops deep to pick up the ball. The player who makes the most runs in behind right now is Jordi Alba. That's your left back, who's also 34, 35 years old. He still has a motor, and it's fantastic. But they need some young players to be able to run in behind. Mm -hmm. Diego Gomez has to do so much work and so much running all over the field to cover for Messi and Suarez. And but he got you, hurt, by the way. Yeah, and when you hurt, see, by the way. yeah, and that's that's a concern. But when you see Campana come into the game and the ball gets in the final third, at least now you have somebody in the box willing to make runs, trying to get on the end of plays. Kaylin, who finishes higher in the East? I, I think these guys are overcomplicating it uh, with Miami. I honestly do. I, I think the way when you think of game breakers, you have Drake Callender, who people were concerned about in the preseason. You can see when the matches start and they matter. He steps up in a big way. And then you have, in case of emergency, as it was against L.A., a break this glass with Lionel Messi. They find a way. I think that's enough of a recipe to continue forward. And I'd probably give them the edge just over uh, Orlando, although I do think it's close. Miami. No way. No you way. You both have Orlando? No way. No way. Why? I'll speak for you, Sash. Uh, or Orlando City is a more balanced roster. Orlando City has a chip on their shoulder because of how last season ended. Oscar Pereira is under a new contract. They're younger. They're more dynamic. Uh, they're not going to be missing their best player for seven games because he's gone for Copa America. If, if Argentina goes to the final Copa America, Lionel Messi misses one-fifth of the regular season. One-fifth? No way. Orlando, Orlando City, as long as everyone's healthy, they'll finish higher in the East. And I think Sasha's got him winning the Supporter Shield. That's how high up. He likes Orlando City. Yeah, Oscar Pereja has done it before. He's won the Supporter Shield in Dallas. He knows what it takes. And now we saw Muriel make his debut this week in the CONCACAF Champions Cup. Had a nice little assist to Nico Lodero. This is a team that has options all over the field and is very deep and very physical. They know how to fight with this Miami team. I expect Orlando to finish higher than Miami this season. No doubt that Orlando City has some unfinished business after falling to the eventual winners, the Columbus Crew in the Eastern Conference semifinals last year. Let's shift gears now to the Rose City. Portland taking on D.C. Both of these teams with incredibly impressive wins over the weekend. Sasha, question, who has you believe in more? Uh, it's Portland for me. The way that they started that game against the Colorado Rapids, attacking from the get-go with a real winning mentality, very dynamic. Eric Williamson back from ACL injury with a goal and an assist. Mm -hmm. Anthony, the young winger, now in his second season, two goals. I really liked what I saw from Portland, and I just think overall they have more quality players than this DC United team. I don't know, Sash. I, the way you started that sentence, at home against the Colorado Rapids. That's the part that gives me pause. And if you think about the first half, they came out strong, but their XG uh, was just 0.7 for both teams, but they were up four goals. So in some cases, that makes me look at the underlying numbers, maybe popping up, you know, everything coming up roses for Portland. I'm not sure that's gonna happen every week. The other side, DC had XG of five. They scored three goals. Benteke was just enormous, as he always is, but the way Troy Lesane has tilted the field in his favor has put him in the box. This looks like a Red Bull play. It's scrappy, it's in the box, but the Red Bulls didn't have a Benteke up front. So I love the way they came out against better competition for me. New England team that I think is really gonna challenge in the East with Caleb Porter, Carlos Hill, all the quality. So I think DC impressed me a little bit more. They played so, against 10 men. Thank you, <laughs> Sasha. So wait a minute. Five expected goals against 10 players. They were better before the red card it's, happened. It's an unbelievable feat, but apparently that's better than the Colorado Rapids. <laughs> I, okay, okay, I follow you, Kalen. I got gotcha. you. So who are you believing, Taylor? Uh, 
Is there an option C? Christian Benteke, <laughs> you believe in, in him? Will he have a better season than last year? 14 Troy, goals last year, Troy 33 saying, years old? It, Troy Lissane is in the building that Benteke is going to score a hat trick. Last year, the Red Bulls, he scored a hat trick against Troy Lissane. This year, Troy Lissane's in the building. He scores a hat trick in his first game. Listen, I, I told you guys last week, my biggest surprise is the Portland Timbers, not from what I saw, but because the fact that they could go out and get two DPs this summer. And if they do that, one of them is a nine, then we can have the conversation. Ten men for the Revs, Colorado Rapids on the other. Uh, I'm going to take C. I might take, the, I might take a ten man Revs over the Rapids right now. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> we'll let the clubs answer oh. this question for us on Saturday. It is your nightcap, Portland taking on D.C. 14 games on this match day three. Lots more to discuss. Hanging out with us still, Kaylin Carr. And now joining us is the armchair analyst, Matt Doyle. And joining us as well, making his This Is MLS debut, Danny Higginbotham, MLS Season Pass analyst and former Premier League defender. Danny, how was opening weekend in Ohio? Thanks for hanging out with us. Yeah, my pleasure. I'm looking forward to, uh, to being involved. Yeah, it was... It was interesting, obviously two games in two days. Um, we did the game at Columbus, then we jumped in a car and drove for about two hours, which would be probably three quarters of the way across England and we were still in the same state. The only problem was spending about four hours with Steve Cangelosi is, um, you know, so not something I'll be wanting to do again. I might drive on my own, but no, it was, it was brilliant. A great experience to, to do Cincinnati, obviously support Shield winners and Columbus as well, who, who won it all. Who won MLS Cup and looked great again. Who drove? I drove. I. That's the interesting thing because I know, like we've that? mentioned it. No, but you know what? They told me that I had to write bills to like random people, like to get the money, and obviously that wasn't going to happen. And like I was, the, I was, I was the one that looked after Donna because we've spoken about Donna. She's she's amazing. Anything that you want, she'll get for you. And I was just like, Donna, do you want a break? And she was like, yeah, 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 give me a break. And none of the other lads, they were just doing sightseeing, taking photos, and everything whilst I'm just driving. So. Yeah, they, they owe me a free meal, I think, so hopefully I'll get that in the next Danny few Danny Higginbotham, a man of the people. All right, let's talk about FC Cincinnati, <laughs> uh, reigning supporter shield winners, Danny. And some people, <clears throat> Kaylin Carr, here in studio oh. last week, said that FC Cincinnati on paper had leveled up. After what you saw, what do you think? I do agree with that sentiment, but I do think it's going to take a while. I think what we have to look at with Cincinnati, for example, we see the game here, obviously, against Toronto. It was very hard going for them. This was the best chance that they had at Costa. He found it difficult to get into the game. And one of the things they're probably lacking at the moment is that little bit of balance. See the opportunities coming their way. Obviously, they've lost Barry out. He's huge for them. And then on the right-hand side, you had Arias as well. So now what you're finding is that Acosta, we know that he loves to drift over to the left, as we can see, getting involved again, Kubo here on the left-hand side. He loves to drift over to the left, and Toronto did a really, really good job with him. And you've, you've got five new players at the club. So that in itself can be an issue. And Pat Noonan, one of the biggest things that he will say is that as a coach, when you have new players, you want time on the training ground with them so they can understand relationships, they can understand the identity of the club, and they've not had that. So I do believe that this could be a team that does better than last season, but it will just take that little bit of time to adjust because the amount of new players and the way in which they're starting the season with the games they've got. I mean, it's also the way that they play. Right, and, and Cincinnati's superpower last year wasn't just Lucho Acosta, who was deservedly the MVP, and it wasn't just that forward pairing uh, who were so good. Brandon Vasquez, of course, one of the five starters from last year who's no longer in Cincinnati. It was Barrial, man. It was Barrial. Like, we had him the best 11 on extra time because his ability as a wingback to get forward and not just add to the attack, but add to the attack as an auxiliary number 10, that protected Lucho from having games where he's targeted, from having games where if he just doesn't quite have it, there was always a secondary playmaker there. And look, they went out and they spent on Luca or Oriano. He struggled in his first week. He wasn't able to hit the last pass consistently. He didn't beat anybody off the dribble. It is a huge ask to go from a best 11 player with the man across the world, because that's the type of guy Barrial was, to a 22-year-old coming in trying to learn a new position in a new system. So when they had to replace four guys, right, when it was Arias and Moreno and Jerzy Mascara and Brent Vasquez, I was like, okay, I can see your point, Kalen. Maybe they have gotten better. Than but you add that fifth, I mean, that's basically half the team, and especially that keystone piece, it's too much. Maybe they get there by the end of the season, but it's going to be a tough start 
for Cincinnati. And I think we already saw that in week one. Okay, one thing to note, Jill, because you did call me out here. I complimented which, you, and Danny agreed with which you. Which is fair. I did which agree. Is fair. I did agree. I said leveled up, but I didn't know at the time that Barrial was going to be fair. moved on. And Danny, I appreciate you being kind to me. But I have to say I was a little bit disappointed week one with playing against the team that had won the winning the wooden spoon, uh, excuse me, for Toronto FC, playing Bernadeschi as a right wing back. Imagine <laughs> with Barrial what would have happened if he was out on that left flank going against Bernadeschi on that flank. I think it would have been a completely different story. Also, Jill, I didn't know at the time as well that Bupenza was going to be on a minutes limitation. I knew Miazga was going to take There's a lot that Kalen doesn't know. There's a lot but that Kalen doesn't say, know, apparently. I, I do have have some concerns, especially with Barrio. I think he is that important to the side. Mm. Danny agreed with you, so I was calling you out and complimenting <laughs> you. I'd like to point I'm, that I'm out. Being one more point. One time. more point. There yes. was there's only one team in the league last year that had two of the top ten chance creators in MLS. It was FC Cincinnati with Lucho Acosta and Alvaro Barriel, and he was the only one of the top ten chance creators who was not a number ten. That tells you the type of player he is. It's tough to replace that man. Kaylin, you mentioned Toronto playing Bernadeschi differently and how well that seemed to work for them in that nil-nil draw to Cincinnati. Danny, how much can Toronto be the surprise team of 2024? They, if, if they continue the way that they started at the weekend against Cincinnati, then I think they could be. You know, they, I, I was fortunate to spoke to John Herdman, had a really good conversation with him. And this was on the Saturday night, obviously the night before the game. And we spoke for about an hour and he went really in depth about the tactical side of things, how he's going to go about it. Obviously, you can see Bernadeschi now playing at right wing back. It's one thing for him to be playing wing back, but then coming over to the right wing back position, we know what he's capable of with that left foot when he goes in field. But the way that John Herdman spoke about it was that we're going to treat this as a home game. He said, my senior plays, and in particular my DP plays, suffered last season. And what we've had to do this off season is create an environment where, let's forget about it, let's turn the page, let's look at the elephant in the room, which was the lack of the lack of really anything last season. And then when he started to get into the tactical analysis and the way that he saw the game against Cincinnati, I was like, part of me was, I was impressed, but the other part of me was, this is information overload. And I just wondered how the players would take it on. And that's why I'm an analyst and he's a coach. He had got everything across to the players. And I asked him the question, I said, you're playing Bernadeschi as a right wing back. You're playing uh, Lorea as your left wing back. How is this going to work? Because there's no width in the team then. And his, sim his simple answer was, we don't have a tall team. Why are we going to continue to put balls into the box? So what he did, and he did it really well. And we saw with the situation, Toronto were wrong, wrongfully given a penalty. It was taken back for a free kick, but he got his, both his wing backs, Lorea and Bernadeschi, to drive in onto their favoured foot. And then you'd see Osorio and you would see Insigne as well, then going outside. And what they were very, very good at, and this, re this probably impressed me more than anything, was their movement and their defensive side off the ball. What they would do with Cincinnati, they would allow Cincinnati when they had the ball to go inside. That's where Toronto's numbers were. But then when Toronto won it back, they broke very, very quickly in the wide areas. They kept Acosta quiet. A lot of the time it was O'Neill that was man for man marking him, but they made sure that he had somebody watching him all the time. And I think a special shout out as well to Flores. He was absolutely magnificent for Toronto in the center of midfield. Yeah, Danny, I was fascinated to see your call of this match, to see what this Toronto team would look like, especially early on in the season under Herdman. And, you know, the thing for me, always with any new manager coming in to impart their philosophy, the best way to get buy-in is with points. And I think we saw before the way Toronto played, they struggled to take a punch. Every single time things went wrong, it felt like this team just imploded. I did a couple of matches at the end of the season. It was depressing. So the fact that they went to Cincinnati to TQL Park on opening day to get a result, I think is going to do wonders for Herdman just to get a little bit of that buy-in for the team and start to build some momentum because last season it went bad match day one in D.C. and then it just sank further and further from there. Danny Higginbotham and Steve Cangelosi will be on the call for St. Louis City hosting New York City FC, the first ever meeting between these two sides. NYC FC manager Nick Cushing coming off of Doyle. What was a really disappointing 1-0 loss to Charlotte over the weekend. They missed the playoffs last year. How much pressure do you think Cushing's feeling right now? I think he's got to be feeling a lot. And from what I heard from sources around the team, there was actually 
a split amongst the decision makers there on Nick Cushing's status mm -hmm. in the middle of last year. Some wanted him out, and some said, no, you know what, we, we dealt him a bad hand by not giving him a complete roster to enter the 2023 season. We got to see out this year and see what he can do with that roster. They ended last season, I think, in pretty good form, and there was a lot of hope heading into this season. They have spent $25 million dollars over the past two uh, transfer Ooh. windows. That is a budget. And they came out <laughs> in week one. <laughs> they were not ready. They were not ready. They got absolutely hammered by this Charlotte team who, I mean, frankly, they were lucky it was only 1-0. Uh, so I think the pressure is going to be on pretty quick. And one thing to keep an eye on, uh, Ronnie Dyla, the former manager of NYCFC, who, of course, won the 2021 MLS Cup with this team, he is under some pressure of his, of his own with Club Bruges over in Belgium. He could be on the hot seat there. So if suddenly he's available and if suddenly Nick Cushing can't put some wins together, I mean, what do you think, Kalen? Maybe this goes bad. I, I don't know. I mean, the big thing that I think is missing for me right now is the profile of players that they've brought in. And for me, they're trying to press a little bit forward on the pitch, but they have a lot of young players, but they're missing, compared to that Ronnie Dyla team that you discussed, that senior leadership. Those players like a Sean Johnson, like a Chano, like a Collins, like a Maxi Morales, that could grab the game, that could go into a tough environment like they did in Charlotte and get a result. And I think when you think of the talent that City Football Group has been able to acquire, it's not the finished article. It's not the final product. But that's that's the, why I'm giving him a little more time. But that's here. the point, right? In his 18 months at the helm, he has not developed any of these great young players that I think 28 other MLS head coaches would say, absolutely, give me that guy. I could get more out of him. That hasn't happened yet with Nick, Nick Cushing. And the, as for pressing, like pressing is intrinsic to the City Football Group system. We don't talk about it as much as we do with Red Bulls because it's the only thing the Red Bulls do. But with CFG, it is part of how they play from Pe at Man City all the way down to NYCFC and points beyond. So he has to get these two things right. He has to make sure they can press without leaving themselves exposed and he has to make sure that these young players get better because otherwise, I mean, that's the job, man. That That is really the job I, for Nick Cushing. Is it just I, me I, or is when Ronnie Dyle has mentioned the first thing that comes to mind is the infamous 2021 MLS Cup <laughs> Championship <laughs> celebration? I'm just saying, how much of that responsibility, though, that these two are debating, Danny, is on mm. Cushing? Yeah, there's, there's, obviously, there's obviously a lot. You know, you you hear, obviously, with Kane and with Matt and the way that they're talking, the biggest thing is there's no identity. That's what there has to be. You know, you, you're used to seeing NYCFC when they won MLS Cup. There was a, a definitive identity with them. And now when you look at them, you see what they're trying to do, but it's not necessarily working. You know that the wingers, that they want to go in field. You know that you want to get the fullbacks overlapping. But the problem is, is that this identity, you know, it's this high pressing. I fear for them on the turnover. And as you quite rightly said against Charlotte, if Charlotte had made the right pass, this could have been 3 4 nil because what they would do, both fullbacks would go forward at the same time. The two centre backs were playing high and there was so much space down the side. So if you're going to be this team that really wants to press high, you want to you want to be able to get amongst the opposition. You see it here, they press well, they win the ball back, and it's a good opportunity. But you have to make sure when you're going to press, it's collective. Because if it becomes individual, then all of a sudden one pass and then the opposition's out and we know how much MLS is about the transition, how much pace there is in teams going forward. So that's going to be key. And also the fullbacks, they're so important. They got themselves into some good areas against Charlotte, but then it was the final ball into the box. Just wasn't good enough. And that's going to be one of the problems for NYCFC. So at times pleasing on the eye, but if you look back to them last season, their best results and their most positive results were when they have less possession than the opposition. So it's going to be interesting to see how it unfolds. Two teams coming off of positive results are Columbus and Minnesota, both getting impressive victories over the weekend. Minnesota, the only team to win away from home. Kalen, who impressed you more? I give it to Minnesota, uh, partly due to some of the context and who is missing. No Reynoso, no Hlangwane, and no manager. I, I mean, I have seen a minor lot. Minor details, minor details. I have seen a lot in my days in Major League Soccer. But to not have a manager full time to start the season is something that I have not seen before. Now, Eric Ramsey, 
was uh, announced yesterday from Manchester United coming over, now the youngest manager by far in MLS, I believe MLS history at 32 years old. Although, I don't know, maybe some of those young guys like <laughs> Benny Olsen or yeah, some of those guys ben Olsen they walked off the 30, pitch, yeah. I'm not sure. But still, it's young, it's inexperienced, but you have to give a lot of credit to this Minnesota team to go on the road. Yes, I know Austin, not in a good place, but big performance from Robin Ludd, who was injured last season, a big miss. If you start to see these pieces coming back together with the new manager stepping in, that's promising for me. So I thought that was a big result. Paul's also the only away result of any MLS team on, on week one. Columbus gets the victory in the first week. The reigning champions, are they the clear favorite for you still, Matt? I, I think so. I think they, they sort of underlined everything that they were good at last year in that performance against Atlanta. Now they didn't score multiple goals. This was only the first time ever in Wilfred Nancy's tenure that they've won an MLS game 1-0. Uh, but I think he likes that because that's where they needed to improve from last year. As great as they are going forward, they need to improve defensively, and we saw it in the Atlanta United uh, series in the first round of the playoffs last year. Atlanta United, they had Thiago Amada for two of the three games. They scored six goals over their two games. So to be the team that can still dominate the ball, and you know they're still gonna score, and they generated tons of chances, including that penalty that was saved, and then throw a shutout on top of it, like it's right now, I think it's Columbus, and it's the rest of the league Looking up at them. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I love Wilfred Nancy. He's he's such a great coach. The way he sees the game, what I love about him is when he did exactly the same thing against Atlanta at the weekend. I was fortunate enough to cover them in the series against Atlanta in the playoffs last year when when they were they were outstanding. But what he does, he takes opposition strengths and makes it a weakness. So a lot of the times you go into games and it's like, oh, you, you have to be mindful of this player, you have to be mindful of that player. Wilfred Nancy, I think he looks at three or four of the best players of the opposition and says, right, okay, how can we make that strength a weakness? And what he did really well at the weekend, he had both his wing backs and he said, what you're going to do was your boa and it was Farsi until Farsi went off injured. He got them both to stretch the game. Just stay out wide. So what they did then, they, allowed, they made those two players stay really wide. That's where they were getting the join, where the space was. The rest of the team went through the middle. And because the rest of the team went through the middle, what is part of Atlanta's strength? It's the fullbacks, it's Wiley, it's Lennon. Lennon and Wiley didn't know what to do, and this is a really good example of it. Lennon gets taken out of the equation because he has to go out to Yaboa. Then a midfielder, I can't remember who it was, doesn't track the run. Rossi gets in, puts it to the far post for Kucho and Anders to put it into the back of the net. And that's what I love about Wilfred Nancy. He's always thinking outside the box. And, you know, you look at some of the acquisitions they've made in the summer. I'm really excited to see Derek Jones. OK, this was the one blemish. But like Derek Jones coming from Charlotte, such a multifunctional player. And that's what Wilfred Nancy wants. He wants a small squad so it can be, it can be a really personal squad. And the way to have that is to have players that can play in so many different positions. They're a well-oiled machine. Yes, they play this 3-4-2-1 or 3-4-1-2, but the way we're seeing again here in which they create situations is absolutely brilliant to see. Minnesota with one of the worst home records last year, just four wins. They will have to start to change that if they want to make a run this season and what a tough task it's going to be against the reigning champions. Danny, thank you so much. Thanks for hanging out with us. My pleasure. Not done yet. We welcome back Sasha Kleshton. We want to get your hot takes as we go around the league and talk about some certain teams. I'm going to come to you and the other two just follow up with a thumbs up or a thumbs down. I've killed your mic, so don't even try it. Let's start off with the Vancouver Whitecaps. If you watched last week, that is Bradley Wright Phillips underdog for 2024. Doyle, what do you need to see from the Whitecaps? I don't think this is going to be a hot take, but I think we need to see more top end quality because they've already proved that they're competent, but every time they get a chance to go against the best in the region. I'm talking Tigres last week and talking Tigres last year in the League's Cup and I'm talking LAFC in the playoffs. They do not have the top end talent to hang with those teams. So I expect to see some competence, but I don't think after the offseason they just had in which they didn't add any big pieces, I don't think you can really expect more than that from this Vancouver team. Sasha, Kalen, can I get your thumbs up or your thumbs down? Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Vancouver, the only team fans have yet to see who had a buy in Everybody opening, agrees opening with week. Everybody agrees with Doyle. That's what the segment is. Agree with Doyle. Dallas taking on Montreal. Dallas coming off of a buzzer beater win, 94th minute from Dante Sealy. 
What are your thoughts on Dallas? Well, this is me again. All right. Uh, I thought Dallas, considering that they were without five starters, including all three DPs, they got a good performance from that man right there, Asir Yaramendi, with this Golazzo. I thought they got a great con contribution at the end from Dante Seeley. And it was fun to see the vibes from this team, including Yaramendi, after the game, getting to wear the big dumb Wait, hat. Are you gonna walk? Are you gonna walk this back? I mean, social media is going crazy right now, Doyle, about this big dumb hat comment. As a fellow Texan, Rude. honorary <laughs> Texan, although from Houston, or you know, spent some time there. What do you, what do you have to say for yourself? I well, first of all, it's a big hat. It's bigger than I thought. All glory to the big dumb hat. I mean, we have to give it to Dallas. Doing this without three DPs, all glory to the big dumb hat. <laughs> Are we giving all the glory to Dallas? I'm giving Dallas social media the thumbs up. That's Sasha? respect for that. Thumbs up for Dallas, thumb down for cowboy hats. <laughs> <laughs> Flip side, Montreal coming off of a nil-nil draw to Orlando. A draw that probably felt like a win for Montreal. Sasha, what do you think? I liked what I saw from Montreal. I liked the organization, and I loved the way they started the game. First 10 minutes, stepping high, pressing high, winning balls high, and creating chances. They forced Gallese into four saves in the first 10 minutes of the game. But you have to finish your chances. They face a similar test in Dallas this weekend. Opoku had a chance, one against one, in stoppage time to steal three points. So starting off the season with six road games, you have to steal some points here. They have to finish their chances this week. Can't argue with that. <laughs> I mean, it's just too good a point, Sasha. Right. You're too good at this. Thumbs up. Sporting <laughs> Kansas City taking on Philadelphia SKC. Fresh off of a 1-1 draw to your former side, the Houston Dynamo. Kalen, thoughts on SKC? Well, I just want to see them learn the lessons from last year where Look, they went through it. The injuries have been well documented, but they were winless in their first 10 matches. I thought it was a positive start. Eric Tommy had a nice goal there, stepping in. Gadi Kinda not on the team anymore, so they have to find that replacement. But they have their guns now, and they have to use them at home going against a Philly team that has put a ton into Champions Cup right now. These matches at home are the type you have to win right now if you're for me. You have to circle this one early on and say, we have to do, take this opportunity at home to get off on the right foot. I mean, kind of true, but like, the West is weaker this year. They could, they could lose 11 to start the season. I think they'll still be okay in the West because that's the type of conference that it is year over year. Well, they'll be going up against a union side that's had a crazy week. They went into extra time. They had to play 30 minutes down a man in CONCACAF Champions Cup, winning against Saprisa. Now they go to Children's Mercy Park. Sasha, question, what do you need to see from the Philadelphia Union? I don't know what I need to see from them this weekend. I want to take a little bit of a big picture look at the it. Philadelphia Union it. because I love what Jim Curtin said this week. He said, we have built an identity and a foundation within this club and anything less than a trophy this year is failure. I love that he has set the expectation high for this group. It's no longer just great to get a bunch of points in the regular season. They have to win a trophy and not a lot of managers put that pressure on themselves. So I love it. And I also want to talk about Quinn Sullivan, who has been the revelation of the season so far. I know it's only been three games, but he has looked fantastic for this Philadelphia Union. I talked to Jim Curtin about Quinn Sullivan. He said he wins every fitness test and that you've seen in the last 15 minutes of games, which he did against Saprissa on the road and Chicago at home, he was able to make the difference in the last 15 minutes of the games. And I think the sky is the limit for this kid. I can't wait to keep watching him and see what he does week in and week out. I'm going thumbs up anytime we can get a Jimmy C quote in there. Thumbs yeah, up for me. Quinn Sullivan as well. Love, okay. love, love his game. Colorado Rapids, couldn't, they couldn't be more disappointed uh, with their performance. You know, Chris Armis, not the debut that he wanted. A 4-1 loss to Portland. Will they turn it around against Nashville? Doyle. I think they will because I think it was some very clear errors that were made in the uh, in this game against Portland and it, mostly around pressing triggers and look you guys have both been around Chris Armas you know he could run a drill you know he could make his intentions to his teammates in your case or his uh, his mentors or his mentees rather he, he can make himself clear in those situations so I expect them to turn around immediately after this disaster that they had on the road they come back home they're at a mile high and they should be able to run Nashville into the ground. Colorado turn it around? Pains me to do okay, it. Okay, they don't. <laughs> so you're saying a Take draw? a stand, Sasha. Get off no the fence. <laughs> he can't do it. He can't do it.
Uh, yeah, oh, he's uh, last uh, service. Yeah. Right, right. Obviously. Right. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, Sasha loses. Uh, Nashville SC nil nil to the New York Red Bulls. No Sam Surridge. No Hani Mukhtar. Both missing opening weekend. How do you think this is going to go for Nashville? Well, it's been difficult for Nashville because this is their first time navigating the Champions Cup and finding out what most teams do in MLS. That is very difficult to try and play in multiple competitions. Then you start looking at the injuries, the absences, none bigger than Hani Mukhtar, who's the biggest of the bunch. You see how that attack just looks lifeless without him and Sam Surge as well. You know, on the positive side, I thought Tyler Boyd looked positive. You look at that Colorado team, the way they were able to get beat down that flank. Thought Sam Vines had a tough one. Mosquera, one of the best attacking wing back options in Major League Soccer. So I think if you're looking for a bounce back game, this is a really good one on the schedule for Nashville to try to target going on the road. Although going to the altitude earlier in the season when you've already put in a ton of minutes is tough. You took every angle on that one. I, I don't know whether you go thumbs up or thumbs down. Well, I can't believe that you went against the, the regular season for Kansas City. You're the supporter shield guy. That's true. Thumbs up so to that. Two thumbs up. <laughs> all right. I'm keeping Kansas City. record of all this. And, you know, next show we're going to come back and see who won our thumbs up or thumbs down segment. All right. So stay tuned for that. We're going to try to top last week. We had a lot of fun wrapping up the show. Taylor Twelman, please try to stay in your chair for this one. Uh, the question I have for you is, we saw the biggest signings, the debutantes in Major League Soccer. Who had the biggest impact on their team? That's a good one because I think this answer is going to change as we get later on the year because I think some of the young players that we saw may be really, really good which traditionally it takes some eight to 10 months. It might this year, mm. but Hugo Lloris for LAFC just looked like he's been there for four or five years. He looked like from the moment he stepped onto the field, there was a confidence with Aaron Long and the center backs around him. There was a confidence from other players. I also really liked the glimpse of his ability to put them out on a counter with his distribution, but he looked as calm and composed as it, And I get it. Listen, anyone watching this is saying, Taylor, he started 20 World Cup games. It's a record. He's be, he's won a World Cup. He's played more goals in goal for than any French goalkeeper. I get all of that. Mm -hmm. But yet before the game, about two hours in, in the tunnel, he looked at me and said, he's nervous. He's anxious. And that tells you that there's still some something left in his career. Sasha, he stood out to me. He looked comfortable. And I think that's a position they've never really done well. Maxime Cripeau was the first goalkeeper in LAFC history that looked the part. I yep. think it's interesting that Hugo Lloris just looked like he fit right in. I talked to a few people, Taylor, around LAFC about Hugo Lloris because he looked fantastic in week one. They said he showed up with no ego, just excited to be there. Didn't talk a lot really in the first few weeks, just went through training. They said that he's made three saves in training where they thought, how the hell did he do that? Just pulling the, you know, the cat pulling the rabbit out of the hat, crazy saves. But on game day, he showed up, was super vocal, talking to all the players, giving them little tidbits, little pieces of information, motivating the guys. He's a real leader, and obviously he still has a lot left in the bag to make those saves. I think he's going to have an impact on this team, similar to what Roman Berkey had in St. Louis Agreed. last season. Agreed. Okay, okay. Agreed. But far be it for me to question a, a World Cup winner, but... Did LAFC, was a goalkeeper position a problem? They won the MLS Cup with, uh, by committee with two goalkeepers. One got injured, Cripo, and then John McCarthy steps in to win it. So it seems a little bit outside the profile. They won that season by committee? It, I'm saying the goalkeeper oh, yeah. position was not the problem for this team. They've done it, but through Carlos Vela, right, but through, through, the, through Buanga, through the attacking players that they've had team, in the past. Five of their six years. It was a problem for LAFC five of the six years. Absolutely, 100%, unequivocally. Maxime Cripeau was the first one. Sure, absolutely. How'd they do last year without him? But, yeah. Kalen, also, Hugo Lloris is an Finals. upgrade, and they've got him at a low salary point against the salary cap this year. This is an amazing signing. That's the difference. I think that's the, the key point, is the way that they've been able to use LA, LAFC, the power that they have to get a Chiellini, to get a Bale, without having to spend that DP. Because you mentioned on the other side, Roman Berkey. That's a designated player spot that they spent a lot of money on. LAFC haven't had to do that. So, for me, it's a little bit of a different category, but... 
I agree with that. That's the X's and O's. I remember when I spoke to Steve Cherundolo Taylor when we were on the call for the Western Conference final, um, the year that LAFC went on to win the whole thing. Steve Trundolo said that Giorgio Chiellini was an extension of the coaching staff on the field. Giorgio Chiellini retires. How much is that player now, Larice? Uh, it is Larice, but also they went out and spent a ton of money on Gareth Bale, by the way. That's part of the reason why he didn't come back. They needed to have the money. Yeah. Uh, Chiell Chiellini's an extension of, uh, of Steve Trundolo. Larice is going to be the same. But any goalkeeper should be an extension of the coaching mm -hmm. staff. They're not on the field of play necessarily running around. So naturally, the goalkeeper in that position is that person. Now, there are some, and all three of us are going to tell you, some goalkeepers you don't want an extension of to, for him to be that. They're different. They're a different breed. I'm, not, I'm going down a rabbit hole we don't need to go to. But the point being is that Hugo Lloris has started 20 games in the World Cup. That's more than any goalie in the history. Steve Trondolo actually may advice from him in certain moments because he's had experience that Steve Trondolo hasn't had. But goalkeeping was always an issue for John Thornton until Maxime Cropot, but he just signed a TAM deal. And Roman Berkey is a, is a TAM-level goalkeeper. He's the highest-paid goalie in Major League Soccer. He outkicked 18 points for St. Louis City. Roman Berkey has convinced me I'm wrong on goalkeepers. You can spend on goalkeepers and get that, but LAFC didn't need to. And can they pulled a rabbit out of their hat for 300 grand to pull off Hugo Lloris as their goalkeeper and keep two DP spots open. It's ridiculous. Can we stop talking about goalkeepers now and start talking <laughs> about number 10s, the real players in Major League Soccer? Because Emil Forsberg is the player we also need to be talking about as going to have the biggest impact on his club, the New York Red Bulls. What I saw in week one was fabulous. He raises the level of his teammates, which is the biggest compliment I can give mm. to any soccer player. When Forsberg is on the pitch, always turning, always facing forward, always trying to make something happen in the final third, he has a real quality that the New York Red Bulls have not had in some years. Kalen, it was so good, too, because he was nil-nil against Nashville, and I fell asleep 35 minutes into the game. <laughs> <laughs> he said he's, he's stood out. I was going to say, you got to wake Taylor up first for this one. Uh, <laughs> I, I like Forsberg. I, I think the Red Bull just desperately needed somebody that they can give the ball to in a difficult moment with that little bit of quality. I think match day one is going to be difficult to judge because you're going against Nashville the way they play the way they set up so defensively in that low block they had no Hani Mukhtar no surge so they were going to always make it difficult I think Forsberg is going to get better and better we're going to see him I'm going to be in Houston calling him this match so I'm hoping to see a little bit more from him Caitlin who you got okay. I think Forsberg is going to be someone we're talking about Sasha yeah, I really do I, I think like he's it. good I just don't know if the rest of Red Bulls actually have enough to maximize what they got in Forsberg. I don't know. That's a perfect transition for me, Taylor, because the guy I'm picking takes it up another level from looking at a, a team that I think is surely a contender to potentially winning a title, and that's De La Vega with Seattle Sounders. We only saw about 30 minutes from him in this match against LAFC. But he looked right to me. A guy that at times Seattle looked a little predictable, but he can beat a guy off the dribble. You see him here just going past Ilya like he didn't even exist, just right by him around that final pass just off. But that chance creation has been an issue for the Sounders for a while now, last season especially. So the idea that De La Vega could step up. The other thing I liked, the personality went and grabbed this ball right away when the penalty uh, came on screen. Grab the ball against Hugo Lloris uh, to be able to put it away. So I think just at 23 years old, also the profile of a guy that's not just going to be here for a year or two or three, kind of like the names uh, my contemporaries mentioned, but somebody that I think Seattle can build around for the long-term future um, and take them to that next level. You cannot teach personality. You cannot teach it. You cannot 100% either you got it or you don't. And while VAR was looking at the call, all the way across the field while Jordan Morris, Christian Roldan, and all the other players were waiting for the call. He walked all the way over, made sure the moment the penalty was called, he was the closest to the ball to take the penalty because more than likely that was going to be Jordan Morris to take that pen. But because he went and got it and looked at his older teammates, more experienced teammates, and said, hang on a minute, this is mine. I'm doing this. He's only been there, guys, 48 hours in the United States. Fitness isn't there. He's got something. And our colleague, Diego Valeri, 
said he is the most exciting player that's coming into Major League Soccer. Now, he knows Lanus better than any of us on this. He knows the Argentine player better than any of us. When I talk to scouts around Europe, he's the one that they're looking at the most that's coming into Major League Soccer. You cannot teach personality. Either you got it or you don't, and he's got it in spades. I think Brian Schmetzer's got some light. He's got a real tricky situation on his hands because in order to maximize him, he's got to figure out that formation because I don't think the current formation is going to work for him if he's thinking about De La Vega staying wide, staying on the left because this guy's got way too much personality to be stuck out wide. He does. Some results in week one to be expected, some not to be expected. So it begs the question. Kaylin, we'll start with you. Which performance that you saw during the course of the week was the biggest mirage? Mirage, like, um, okay, I got that. Like, it took me a second. Like, <laughs> looks good, but not gonna happen. Maybe not quite what it is. I don't wanna rain on anybody's parade because it looked like such a fun party in Charlotte. 62,000 jumping before the match. Dean Smith at the helm, new manager bounce. But I have to say, I still don't think this team is a playoff team for me. I don't know if it's gonna be that have that personality that Taylor mentioned to be able to get that killer goal. A lot of opportunities in the second half. The one thing that stood out to me, Taylor, they had the penalty. Capetti gives the penalty to Vargas. I don't know the number nines that I played with. You were one of the best out there. I can't imagine. Are you handing that penalty over to anyone? Hold on. Can I just ask a question? What else could mirage mean? <laughs> <laughs> I just really want to know. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah thanks. First, thanks sorry. so much. I, <laughs> the most concern, concerning part to all this is that Cal Berkeley education, he had, <laughs> he had to get mirage clarified there. Okay. Um, no, a, any center forward that you want in your team, it's me, myself, and I. And if it's not me, myself, and I, then that number nine has <laughs> got to have a screw loose or something wrong. So to answer your question, absolutely. Guys, the mirage of the weekend, and I don't care what you two knuckleheads are going to tell me, Minnesota? Minnesota? So the best part is we launched this show. We talk about Minnesota last week, and Sasha and I are getting notes from someone on social media oh, no. saying we were so unprofessional on how we <laughs> talked about no coach or no technical <laughs> director or no GM. That's not an opinion. <laughs> That's, he did it a whole preseason, and they were like, "Oh, do you you want to coach? You, you want to coach? How about I coach? Who's the GM? Should we do it? Sure." <laughs> they went to Austin. They got a result. They did it without their best player. Tell me right now, Reynoso not in the lineup, not on the field. Minnesota is going to win another game or two. I don't know about that one, Sasha. I don't know. Uh. Uh-uh. Uh. I don't know. They looked pretty good in attack. They Granted, did. they played they against did. Austin, which is, uh, I don't know, that, that, that could be a bottom team this season. All right, for me, my mirage is the New England Revolution. I, I, I don't think what we saw in D.C. this weekend, being down a man for so long, they showed some fight to come back in the game. They still have too much quality on the field. This goal from Carlos Hill got us all out of our seats. This is the magic that this man can produce week in and week out. Vrioni, though, the number nine, getting the red card, putting his team yep. down a man. He, that's how you get in the doghouse with the coach and with your teammates, and they need somebody to score goals for this team. They have creators. They have dangerous players all over the midfield, all over the attack, but they need a number nine to score goals. Sasha, that's the biggest one for me. Uh, I was on this match, and Caleb Porter spoke to me throughout the week saying he really hasn't had the trust or the confidence or run of matches, and Caleb put his backing behind him and said, hey, this is going to be our guy. But the bigger issue for me is really with Vrioni and his teammates, not trying to win the, the respect of the manager, but your teammates. When you go out in the 25th minute and the rest of your team has to run for 60 plus minutes, they fight their way back into the match. Carlos Hill, the best player on the pitch, wasn't just scoring goals like that. He was running back, tracking back defensively. You go back in that locker room, that's going to be a big one. I think Frioni has got to re-earn the trust of his team first if he wants to uh, find his way back into this team and prove that this team can take it to the next level. Because you know Caleb Porter, he does not care too much about the regular season. He's got one idea and one idea only. That's MLS Cup. That's all that matters to the Revs. And I'm not sure if Rioni is that guy to take them over the hump. My, my only concern, though, and I think Sasha's on to something here. My only concern about them being a barrage is that for Caleb Porter, it's feast or famine. Either they make the playoffs or and win the MLS Cup or they don't. And you look at it, 
it's playoffs miss, playoffs miss. In the last two years in Columbus, he missed back-to-back seasons for the first time in his coaching career. My issue is this, guys. I've been on the record. I'm going to stay on the record. Is It's only up to the locker room. The locker room dealt with a lot of stuff last year, and Bruce Arena and Richie Williams and all the stuff around that and the multiple coaching changes and whatnot. And I said you're going to know a lot about the locker room. That locker room fell flat, flat. They fell flat at the end of the year, and they were pointing fingers at everybody else. You can't now just point fingers at Veroni. Veroni, bonehead, dumb, get it. But the locker room to me is not as strong with the core veteran players that they have as it should be. I hope Sasha's correct, but there is a small part of me that says that locker room isn't strong enough to deal with any kind of adversity. All right, that does it for our show. But before we let you go, Taylor Twelman, I just want to wish you a happy birthday. My, our leap year baby here on the MLS season pass. You are the most accomplished 11-year-old that we know. <laughs> Mirage, <laughs> M-I-R. You guys did this to Brad last week. You're now just ganging up on me, uh, man. I mean. <laughs> absolutely. M-I-R. We'll let you go, Taylor. We know Frank you've got tank. a birthday party that we're all invited to to get to. We'll see you there in a few hours, nope. okay? Nope, nope. You guys are not invited. You guys are <laughs> See you in a little bit. Can't wait. <laughs> Still waiting on my tickets. See you in a bit.